Let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word and for the opportunity to study it together this evening. Uh, Father, please give us clear minds and hearts to be receptive to your word. Um, Father, most importantly, may your son Jesus Christ be glorified in our time together. We ask it in his name. Amen. Well, first of all, I experienced a miracle earlier that I have to share with you all. I ate nachos, two plates, and didn't spill any on my coat or my shirt. I think it's the first time ever. Anyway, uh, we've made it to chapter 12 of the epistle to the Hebrews. And what we learned in chapter 12 is the Christian life is a race. Did you know that? The Christian life is a race. Not a race where we compete with one another, but it's an individual race that we all run as believers. Our race began when we received Jesus Christ as our Savior, and it will continue until we are face-to-face with him in heaven. And like any other race, it, it is painful at times. It requires training. There's a goal. There's a finish line. There are rewards at the end of the race. But what we need most of all in our Christian race is to endure. And the main theme of Hebrews chapter 12 is running the race with endurance. And what we'll see, uh, I don't know, did you all get a handout? I have a handout here I should probably pass out. Thank you, Brad. Sorry about that, guys. But what you'll see on your handout is we have three major, uh, or four major divisions of an outline for Hebrews 12. We'll see um, energy to run uh, with endurance, elements through which we must endure in this life, and an encouragement to endure. And then finally, we'll look at the the last warning passage in Hebrews, the fifth and final one. Thank you for doing that, Brad. As we're getting started, uh, let's, let's look at the first section of our outline, where we get our energy in order to run with endurance in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through Three. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, lay, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. When I was a kid, I was racing a friend of mine on our bikes, our bicycles down the street, and I was winning the race. And I was looking back at him to see where he was and make sure I was ahead of him. And all of a sudden I come to an abrupt stop because I hit a parked car. And I smack my face, I bloody nose, bloody lips, and end up losing the race. But my problem was I was looking in the wrong direction. I was looking at the one I was competing with instead of looking ahead in that particular instance. But as the Christian life is likened to a race in these verses, right off the bat we see the directions in which we are supposed to look. We're supposed to look back to the saints, the godly heroes of the Old Testament, who were able to endure their race through faith. We are to look up to the Lord Jesus Christ to be occupied with him. He is the goal of our race. And we are to look forward um, to meeting him in glory, look forward to the reward that will be there when he's standing at the end saying, well, good, well done, my good and faithful servant. So first of all, let's look back again to the saints of the Old Testament. You remember a couple of weeks ago, Um, We talked through Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter. We surveyed all of these godly heroes from the Old Testament who endured their race through faith. It says in in verse 1, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, many people will interpret this verse um, to mean that 
Um, believers of times past who have died are, are spectators in heaven cheering us on to, to run our race. And uh, I submit to you that that is a wrong interpretation. As far as I can tell, biblically speaking, when a believer dies, he goes face to face with the Lord in glory, awaiting the time of future resurrection and judgment. Um, I don't see any indication that Christians are looking down, watching us or cheering us on or interceding for us in heaven. I think rather what the uh, verse is saying, it's kind of like when you drive down a really foggy road first thing in the morning in the fall season, and you're just overwhelmed by the cloud of fog. You can't even see the cars around you. All of us have probably been in that instance. The idea is when you open the word of God, you are surrounded, you're overwhelmed by a cloud of examples of people whom God has used and who were able to endure their race successfully because of faith. The therefore in the very beginning of our um, verse in chapter 1 connects chapter 11 to chapter 12, and the cloud of witnesses has to be the great heroes of the Old Testament. It's as if, um, if you will, for the sake of analogy, they're passing the baton off to us. We see that they were able to run their race with endurance. It has been done. The example is there. So take their examples and apply it to your life. Endure with faith. So we must look back to the heroes that God has raised up in the past, but we must also look up to the Lord Jesus. It says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now, if there was just one verse, if I had to select one verse that encapsulated the entire Christian experience, it would have to be um, verse 2 here, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Just as a, a marathon runner wouldn't dare um, run his race without eating in several days, having no source of energy, not drinking plenty of water, he would collapse right away. He needs a proper source of energy before he even attempts to run his race. So similarly, if we want to have the energy, the fuel, if you will, to run with endurance, we must look to the Lord Jesus and be occupied with him. He is our purpose. He is our ultimate example of enduring faith. And notice what it says, that he endured for the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? That joy is you and me and any sinner that receives him by faith, that he could present them faultless before his throne and exceeding glory before his father, that we'd be part of his fold, part of his family. And so we were the joy set before him that enabled him to endure his mission. He should be our joy that enables us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 2, being rooted and built up in him. And it uses this analogy as if we were trees and our roots grow deep down to the soil of Jesus Christ, by which we get all of the nutrients that we need to grow. Similarly, Jesus uh, commands us to abide in him and uses the analogy of a vine and branches. And it's through abiding in Jesus Christ that fruit is born. If we are not occupied with Jesus Christ, we will never run the race with endurance. I have a poem here I'd like to read about looking to Jesus in our race. It says, I'm looking unto Jesus. I'm keeping my eyes on him. For this race I am running, I know together we will win. The track that's before me keeps going round and round, but with Jesus as my coach, each obstacle I can bound. If I'm to go the distance, then I'll need a place to rest, so I'll turn to my Savior for strength to do my best. As I come upon the hurdles thrown at me each day, I will rely on Jesus to move them out of the way. This race is long and hard. There is no easy road. But with Jesus at my side, he'll help me with my load. I'm looking unto Jesus. I got to keep going straight. For if I take my eyes off him, I might miss the narrow gate. That was a poem by a lady named Deborah Ann Belka. Um, but I thought it aptly illustrated 
our passage. We must look to Jesus. Um, and finally, we must look forward to the reward at the end of our race. And remember, our rewards are designed to eternally glorify Jesus Christ. I don't run the race with the motivation to get a reward to exalt myself at the end, but the rewards will exalt Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So to have the proper energy to run our race, we must look to Jesus and be fueled by him. We must look back to the examples of godly saints of the past who have proven that it can be done. You can run your race with endurance, and that doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect walk. It doesn't mean you'll never stumble or never fall, but you can endure if you keep your eyes on Jesus. We must look in the right directions, but we must also loosen the excess baggage. Loosen the excess baggage. It says um, in verse 1 again, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. A few years ago, I was flying to California, and I was on my way to the airport, and I got caught in I-25 traffic, and I was delayed, and I was running very late. And I got to the airport, got through security, and I literally had to run uh, to my gate if I was going to get there in time. And I remember I had two bags, and I um, was running and carrying the bags and thinking how much easier it would be to run to the gate without this luggage. And similarly, if we're going to run a race, if we're going to uh, endure the Christian life and the elements in our walk, we have to get rid of the excess baggage that will hinder our walk and slow us down. Have you ever seen someone who's going to run a marathon carrying a bunch of luggage? It just wouldn't be practical. But in the context, the historical context of the epistle to the Hebrews, as we've already noted their temptation to go back to the law and back to Old Testament Judaism, I think the baggage here is uh, the Old Testament law and Old Testament religion. And the idea is you can't, you can't move forward in your Christian race if you're trying to carry the law with you in Old Testament religion. Jesus has ratified a new covenant. We're no longer under the law. We are now under grace, the scriptures teach us. And a primary theme in Hebrews is Christ is superior to all of those things. We must cut off the excess baggage. Maybe for you, the, the baggage isn't the temptation to go back to Old Testament religion, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a, some sort of worldly pursuit. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a bad habit. It could be all kinds of things, but we all perhaps have weights that are hindering us from running our race effectively, we must cut them loose if we want to run with endurance. Sports are a, a big part of our culture today. We have uh, football, baseball, basketball, etc. And uh, sports were a big part of the culture in the Roman Empire when the epistle to the Hebrews was written. Uh, it goes all the way back to ancient Greece and the Athenian games, something like the Olympic games today. It's a huge part of their culture. And the, the runners in their races would train with weights to build strength and to ultimately increase their speed. But none of them would bring the weights to the track on race day. And I think similarly, um, when we look at the Old Testament law, in Galatians it says the law was a tutor for us, a teacher, to train us, to bring us until the time of Christ where he fulfills and takes away those things. And uh, similarly, the, the law was a great trainer in God's progressive plan, but now the law is over. We must take off the weights if we're to run the race effectively. But it's not only the, the weight, the excess baggage here, but it's also the sin that we are to lay aside. And this sin is singular here. And I don't think it's talking about general sins, even though general sins can be a problem in our race. I think the sin that it's referring to is the sin of unbelief in the sufficiency of Christ. Look at the context. What's the context of chapter 11 again? It's faith. Remember, that's the primary theme. And what was it that enabled these godly saints to endure? It was faith. And to go back to the Old Testament law and the Old Testament rituals and the Old Testament sacrificial system was a lack of faith in the sufficiency of what Jesus has done. So again, maybe the sin for you in your Christian race is just anything that's hindering your walk with Jesus Christ, anything that's blurring your focus from him. We have to cut it loose, the weight and the sin. 
So we've looked at the source of energy. We have to look in the right places. We have to let go of the extra stuff that would hinder us. Let's now survey some of the elements we must endure through in our race. We see persecution from sinners, parental discipline from our loving father, people in general, passions of the flesh. All of these things are, are potential barriers um, that could derail us in our race if we don't endure. We must be aware of these elements that we must endure through. Let's look at the first one in verse 4, persecution from sinners. In Hebrews 12, 4, it says, you have not yet resisted to blood, bloodshed, striving against sin. Now, he's not talking about striving against personal sins, even though we all strive against sin. He's saying you have not yet been martyred. You have not yet been killed for your faith, um, resisting against sinful men. Um, just as Christ endured the shame, endured the persecution when he went to the cross, so are we to endure the persecution. And there was no lack of persecution for these Hebrew Christians in the first century. We... Uh, we're pretty blessed and lucky and fortunate to be Christians in the United States today. Even though our nation is progressively getting more and more secular and maybe more antithetical to Christianity, we still haven't even begun to face persecution like believers have of the past, or even believers currently do in other parts of the world. But Paul says in 2 Timothy, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so, Persecution isn't always manifested in um, being beaten physically or thrown in jail or being killed. Um, maybe all of us have been ridiculed for our faith before. Um, people have attacked us with arguments or mocked us. I think all of us have probably faced that, and these maybe are minor forms of persecution. But we must endure persecution from the unbelieving world, from sinners, in order to run our race effectively. Furthermore, we must endure the parental discipline from our Heavenly Father. I apologize, the font is kind of small here, so I, I hope you're able to read it. Um, but verses 5 through 11 in Hebrews 12, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you are enduring chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subject, in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. The author to the Hebrews gives a rather lengthy uh, dedication here to the reality of God's chastening or disciplining of his children. And he uh, quotes from Proverbs uh, chapter 3 here. But what's interesting about God's discipline of believers is it's a manifestation of his love and a revelation of the fact that we are indeed his children. The, the Old Testament says that uh, a parent who does not, uh, or a parent that uh, spares the rod from his child does not love his child, and hates his child. And the idea is if we rob our children of discipline, of how to submit to authority, how to operate in the world, it's going to cause tremendous harm and damage to them in the long run. And so we don't discipline them out of an abusive motivation, but because we love them and we want to see them succeed. Similarly, God's discipline of us as his children is not an expression of his wrath, which was appeased at the cross. It's an expression of his love. 
But it's interesting, so oftentimes, so much of the misery, so much of the suffering that we face in this life, in our race, um, is self-inflicted because we disobey our Heavenly Father. And so much of it doesn't even have to come from his direct hand. It's just the natural byproduct of living in this life and trying to live outside of God's plan for us. When I was a kid, no more than three years old, I was outside with my dad as he was barbecuing on the grill. And uh, he had to go in to grab either some ingredients or a utensil. And he said, whatever you do, do not touch the grill. And I was too young to understand that uh, it would burn me. So he walks in the house, and the first thing I do is put my hand on the grill. And uh, of course, it scorched my hand, and he heard me scream and came out, and they had to bandage my hand up. And you see, my dad wasn't being a rude dictator by putting the law in front of me, don't touch the grill. He just didn't want to see me hurt myself. But I couldn't understand that. If I would have just obeyed him, it would have saved me from the pain. And similarly, if we would just obey our Heavenly Father, he gives us these commands in our life to save us from the pain and the disaster of trying to live this life apart from him. As Christians, we are designed to constantly be in communion with our Heavenly Father father but when we walk outside of what we're designed for it just isn't going to be right fish are designed to swim in the sea and birds are designed to fly in the air but if you put a bird in the sea it's not going to be a very happy bird if you put a fish in a nest in the trees it's not going to be a very happy fish similarly if we're walking outside of god's design for us um, we're not going to be very content But sometimes beyond just the natural suffering that comes from disobeying God, sometimes God has to inflict discipline himself. Um, We're all aware of the fact that it's a common metaphor in Scripture that the Lord is our shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. We are all sheep of his fold. And something I recently learned about uh, shepherds and sheep... um, is that uh, when a a sheep strays often, it becomes very dangerous for that sheep. Number one, they are completely defenseless creatures. They have no way to defend themselves. They can't fight off a wolf or a predator. But secondly, they're, they're too, quite frankly, dumb to find their way back. If a sheep strays, it will not find its way back. So the shepherd has to seek out the sheep. Furthermore, if the shepherd doesn't guide them to the right areas, the right pastures to eat from, uh, they'll, they'll be malnourished, and they can die that way. They are utterly dependent upon the shepherd for their survival. No wonder um, the analogy is used of us. We're utterly dependent on our Lord. So if a sheep continues to stray and to stray, the shepherd will break its leg, believe it or not. The shepherd will break its leg, and he will bind the leg, and he will carry the sheep on his, on his back, and he'll care for the sheep and, until it heals. But after the cast comes off, that sheep won't leave the shepherd's side. It will stay close to the shepherd. It will constantly nudge its head against the shepherd's leg and becomes like a leader for the other sheep. And similarly, um, we as believers, when we keep straying off the course of our race enough, God has to inflict suffering sometimes to bring us back to him. Again, this is a manifestation of his love. God's chastening of us reveals our sonship. It renews our worship and it restores our fellowship to him. Also, um, God does not spank the neighbor's kids. So if you experience discipline, chastening from the Lord, again, this is a revelation of the fact that you're a son of God. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to keep you from straying into danger. We see this uh, happening with the Corinthian church. God was making some of them weak and ill, and some of them even died prematurely because of the way, the grotesque way they were handling the Lord's table and the divisions among them. And we see other examples of this in scripture. Um, But God sometimes will inflict suffering on us to bring us back, to get our attention. And this should cause us to cling tightly to him. Don't be discouraged when he disciplines you, rather cling to him and he will get you through it. The next element that we must endure through is people in general. People in general, it says in in chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 
looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now I know I'm probably the only one in this room that gets derailed by people sometimes, or my, my peace will be robbed because of people irritating me or doing something that um, causes me anguish, but we are to endure through these things. We're commanded to pursue peace with all people. Something similar is said in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 16 through 19, and I don't have them on the PowerPoint, but I'll read them real quick. It says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You might say, Sam, how am I supposed to not get worked up? How am I supposed to uh, not be derailed by people who wrongly treat me, who annoy me, who do all of these things? It's, it's kind of similar to when Christ says, forgive one another, even to the standard that God has forgiven us. To love as Christ has loved, we can't do it in our own strength. We need God's spirit. We need God's help. And that goes back to the right energy for our race. Look to Jesus. Walk closely to him. Cast it to him in prayer. Uh, scripture says, casting all of our cares on him, for he cares for us. But if we're constantly allowing ourselves to be derailed in our race by people, we're going to be set back. If we're focusing on what people are doing to us rather than what God has already done for us, it's going to be a bad thing. And then roots of bitterness, it says, can occur. And uh, we've all heard, heard it said, you will reap what you sow. And uh, so if we, we sow uh, seeds of bitterness, so to speak, on people, if we have resentment towards people, if we're uh, looking at people negatively, those roots will grow, and it's eventually going to uh, reap something, which is not only going to be harmful to you, but those around you. Have you ever lost your temper before, and not only did that affect your spiritual walk, but it affected someone else's spiritual walk because you blew up at them or you got impatient with them? You didn't demonstrate the love of Christ towards them? We're all guilty of it, but this is just an element of this life, of this race we're enduring, is we're going to have people who annoy us, and we have to just endure, cast it to the Lord, and focus on him. Furthermore, we must endure the passions of the flesh. It says in verses 16 and 17, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Um, this is an interesting passage because when you uh, go back to Genesis and you read about uh, Jacob and his brother Esau, um, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't really mention anything about him being a fornicator or sexually immoral and profane, um, but this is some insight that we get in this epistle. But I think the main point that it's making is he was a man driven by the passions of his flesh. He was completely controlled by instant gratification um, instead of being reasonable about his situations and being willing to endure. So Jacob and Esau were uh, twins in the womb, but Esau emerged first, and uh, by natural birthright, he was to um, uh, be the recipient of the inheritance foremost, and we know that Jacob did a lot of deceptive things, and we're not going to go into all of the verses in Genesis, but we do know that when Esau got home one day and he was exhausted and he was extremely hungry and Jacob had boiled up probably a pot of beans that just must have smelled delicious, 
And uh, Jacob said, do you want these, Esau? And Esau was like, I'd do anything for those. And he said, okay, give up your birthright to me. So Esau says, okay, I'll do it. And he eats the beans. And then, of course, he regrets it. He regrets it tremendously. And he, and he seeks repentance diligently with tears, but it was too late. And, of course, Jacob ended up getting the blessing, the inheritance, which was all part of God's sovereign plan anyway. But the point of the passage is don't follow Esau's pattern of behavior. Don't be driven by the passions of the flesh. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual morality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. We all have the flesh. We all have the passions of the flesh in us. We have this sinful predisposition uh, towards things which are contrary to God, the lusts of the flesh mentioned in Galatians 5, but we also have God's Spirit. And the point is, we no longer, we have been liberated from the slave master of sin. We no longer have to submit to his control. We have another option now. We can instead walk by means of the Spirit and have the fruit of the Spirit, the character of Christ. But we must endure the temptations of the flesh. They come and go. They're fleeting. Don't be captivated by them as Esau. Next, let's look at a word of encouragement to endure. There's a lot of uh, things that we must endure through that we just saw. We, we've seen the, the energy source being occupied with Jesus Christ through which we can endure, but we get a further word of encouragement in verses 18 through 24. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and a blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling, but you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than that of Abel. Now, these are all such easy, straightforward passages. They almost don't even warrant explanation, right? Of course not. Uh, this seems like a difficult passage, but what it's contrasting is two uh, spiritual mountains, if you will. It's contrasting Mount Sinai, where the law was given uh, to Moses and to Israel from Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. And the idea here is that we haven't come to Mount Zion, where um, fear and trembling is with the law that reveals sin and that brings judgment and that can't resolve our sin problem, but we've come to Mount Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And so it's alluding back to Exodus chapters 19 and 20 when God gives the law. It was a solemn event. It wasn't a happy time. Very solemn, very serious, very somber. And it was commanded, no one was to touch the mountain. When Moses was up there um, receiving the commandments from the Lord, the, uh, any animal that was on the mountain was to be killed immediately. And it was, I think, um, portraying the, the significance of the holiness of God, the justice of God, and the reality of our sin that the law reveals. Um, but that's not what we're coming to. We're not coming to God on the basis of fear, but we're coming to Mount Zion, the result of all that Jesus Christ has accomplished and what Jews uh, were ultimately looking forward to. Now, we read in Scripture in Revelation chapter uh, 21 and 22 that a new Jerusalem will come out of heaven onto the earth. There will be a new heavens and a new earth where perfect righteousness will dwell forever. Um, Jesus Christ himself will be reigning on the earth. Um, there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. Um, but that hasn't happened yet on the earth. But these blessings are in heaven, and um, that's where we are registered. That's what we look to. 
the place where there is an innumerable company of angels. There's the church, the general assembly of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. There's the presence of God who is judge of all. The spirits of just men made perfect. That's probably Old Testament saints who are believers. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and the testimony of his blood that speaks better than that of Abel. Now, it's interesting. There's a few passages in the New Testament that refer to the blood of Abel. Um, it was mentioned in Hebrews 11 that we didn't really go into last time. It's mentioned in this passage. It's mentioned in 1 John. And the, the blood of Abel essentially speaks of a need for justice. Um, but Jesus Christ in perfect justice has purged our sins. And of course, this is a weighty uh, passage of scripture that um, if we had more time, I would love to exegete and go into far more detail. But that is a general, I think, understanding of the passage. It's to be an encouragement to us to move forward, to endure in our race. Uh, and finally, we get to the last warning passage in Hebrews, which uh, really is a connection with this encouragement passage. Um, but it says, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. You notice this concept of shaking here. And the idea behind the word is uh, like when a great wind comes on the sea and ruffles or shakes a boat uh, really severely. And there is going to be a judgment coming both on this earth as well as in heaven. But anything that God has done, like our salvation or the rewards that he secured through us, will not be shaken. They're, the things that God has done on our behalf is now impervious to judgment. We do not have to fear being shaken because we are in Jesus Christ. So this, even though it's a warning, it's really a tremendous encouragement. You are going to inherit a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And uh, if that doesn't encourage you to run your race with endurance, I don't know what will. When you were a kid, did you ever do arts and crafts with glitter? Do you remember uh, making designs with glue? And then you cover the whole thing in glitter, and then you shake it off over the trash, and the excess glitter falls off, but what was stuck to the glue remains, and you have a picture, you have a design. I think similarly, that's kind of how it is um, with the things going on in this earth and our Christian race. Uh, the glue, if you will, is the Lord's working in your life. It's all that Jesus Christ has done in you and for you. And uh, the glitter is, uh, is all the, the works of our life. And if we're stuck to him, that will remain after the shaking. But everything else, all the other excess stuff is going to be shaken off in judgment. So cling to the glue. <laughs> Um, and by the way, if you want to jot this down and study it later, it's an allusion back to Haggai 2.6, um, this shaking concept and future uh, judgment. But in conclusion here, um, the Christian life is not an easy race, but God's given us the grace by which we must endure it. We get energy through being occupied with Jesus Christ. We've been um, informed of the elements we must endure through. Um, again, we have the sufficient grace from him. There will be reward at the end of the race through which we can glorify Christ. So let us keep on running. And uh, I apologize that I haven't been able to really explain some of the passages in here adequately. But if you have any questions afterward, feel free to ask. And uh, I'll close this in prayer. And then there's a few announcements. Father, thank you so much for your love for your grace. Thank you for uh, the sufficiency of all things you've given us to run our race effectively. Um, Lord God, uh, help us to be mindful of these things, to be challenged, to apply them to our lives, and to pursue you daily through faith. In Christ's name, amen.
Yeah. Do you want to do the? So just uh, some of our um, announcements. Um, starting now, going forward, we have the uh, Christmas Advent season in our main service on December 17th at 6 p.m. We have a Christmas um, hymn time, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Brad and I were strategizing a bit today. There's going to be some great stuff, so I highly encourage you to come if you can make it. Um, we'll also acknowledge Hanukkah and kind of explain what that's about. Um, December 18th through 26th, uh, if you can, please be at the services. We have a Christmas Eve service on December 24th at 6 p.m. and a short Christmas Day service um, at 10 a.m. And uh, what better place to be than church when we commemorate the birth of Christ, right? And that's all I got. Have a good night, guys. Thank you.